बंगाल में व्यापार का परिदृश्य तय करने में नदियों की दशा और दिशा का बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण योगदान रहा है जैसे कि सरस्वती नदी के किनारे स्थित सतगांव सोलहवीं सदी के मध्य तक बंगाल का सबसे महत्वपूर्ण बंदरगाह हुआ करता था यहाँ से बर्मा मलय उपमहाद्वीप और सुमात्रा तक बंगाल के व्यापारिक संपर्क थे सन सोलह में हुगली में पुर्तगालियों के सौभाग्य का सूरज अस्त हो गया पुर्तगाली व्यापारियों के एकाधिकार और मनमानी से तंग आकर मुगल बादशाह शाहजहां ने पुर्तगालियों पर हमला कर दिया हुगली पर कब्जा हो गया पुर्तगाली हार गए और उन्हें बतौर युद्धबंदी आगरा ले जाया गया बाद में उन्हें हुगली लौटने की इजाजत दी गई मगर तब तक हुगली के कारोबारी परिदृश्य पर से उनका एकाधिकार खत्म हो चुका था पंद्रह सौ निन्यानवे में बना ये चर्च आज भी हुगली में पुर्तगाली व्यापारियों की मौजूदगी और उनकी गतिविधियों की याद दिलाता है पुर्तगालियों के बाद यहाँ डच आए सोलह सौ पैंतीस में हुगली में पहली डच फैक्ट्री तामीर हुई हुगली से वे चिंसुरा कासिम बाजार और ढाका तक फैलते चले गए कासिम बाजार में बनी ये डच कब्रगा डच व्यापारियों की मौजूदगी का सबूत देती है आज भी स्थानीय लोगों में इस कब्रगाह के बारे में कई तरह के मिथक मौजूद हैं, जो डच व्यापार से जुड़े हैं। 1650 के दशक तक बंगाल के व्यापार पर डच व्यापारियों का नियंत्रण रहा मगर बाद में बंगाल का कारोबार उनके हाथ ऐसी फिसल अंग्रेजों की गिरफ्त में चला गया बंगाल में अंग्रेजों ने अपनी सबसे पहली फैक्ट्री सोलह सौ में हुगली में लगाई फिर हुगली से वे सोलह सौ नब्बे में कोलकाता पहुंच गए क्योंकि कोलकाता समुद्र के ज्यादा नजदीक था वहां यूरोपीय प्रतिद्वंदी भी नहीं थे और ये बंगाल के नवाबों की पहुंच से भी दूर था सत्रह सौ सत्रह में मुगल सम्राट फारूक सियार के फरमान की बदौलत बंगाल के कारोबार और व्यापार पर अंग्रेजों की ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी का पूरा नियंत्रण हो गया अब हम बढ़ रहे हैं चंदन नगर की तरफ ये एक फ्रांसीसी आबादी है जो हुगली नदी के किनारे बसी है बंगाल के साथ संपर्क कायम करने की फ्रांसीसी कोशिशें सोलह सौ के आसपास शुरू हो गयी थी और 1700 के नजदीक उन्हें चंदन नगर में मकान और फैक्ट्रियां बनाने की 
इजाजत मिल गई चंदन नगर की गलियों में चलते वक्त हमें कई ऐसी इमारतें नजर आती हैं जिन्हें फ्रांसीसियों ने उन्नीसवी सदी में बनवाया था उनके सामने अंग्रेजों की जबरदस्त प्रतिद्वंदिता थी लिहाजा वे बंगाल में अपना कारोबार बढ़ा नहीं सके और चंदन नगर तक ही सिमट कर रह गए ये ऐतिहासिक इमारतें आज तक भी चंदन नगर पर फ्रांसीसी हुकूमत की याद ताजा कराती लगती हैं। डेनिश हुगली नदी के किनारे पर फैक्ट्रियां लगाने की कोशिश की 1735 में उन्हें सिर्फ सेरमपुर में फैक्ट्री कायम करने की इजाजत दी गई। लेकिन डेनिश व्यापारी भी सेरमपुर से आगे नहीं बढ़ सके डेनिश व्यापारियों की याद सेरमपुर स्थित कई ऐतिहासिक इमारतों से ताजा हो जाती हैं। एक प्रख्यात पूर्वी विद्वान विलियम कैरी ने सेरमपुर को ज्ञान का एक महान केंद्र बना दिया तो इस तरह सोलहवी सदी में पुर्तगालियों से शुरू करके अठारहवी सदी के मध्य तक अंग्रेजों की ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी ने बंगाल के कारोबार पर एकाधिकार कायम कर लिया हम पाते हैं कि कई यूरोपीय कंपनियां इस फिराक में थीं कि बंगाल में मौजूद व्यापारिक अवसरों पर काबू करके अपनी किस्मत चमकाई जाए अंग्रेजों की व्यापारिक गतिविधियों में इजाफे से कलकत्ता ब्रिटिश कारोबारी कामकाज का एक केंद्र बनकर उभरा न्यू पोर्ट हो या न्यू मार्केट या नई इमारतें सभी इस बात की तस्दीक करती हैं कि कलकत्ता बंगाल में ब्रिटिश कारोबार की बढ़ती महत्ता का पर्याय बनता जा रहा था यूरोपियों की नजरों में बंगाल का बढ़ता महत्व मूल रूप से यहाँ की विशाल कृषि संसाधनों की उपलब्धता की वजह से था बंगाल को इस उपमहाद्वीप का अन्न भंडार कहा जाता था चावल के अलावा चीनी पान और जूट यहाँ की महत्वपूर्ण कृषि फसलें थीं। जल्दी ही इन फसलों की जगह कपास और रेशम ने लेती जिनकी यूरोपीय बाजारों में बड़ी मांग थी कासिम बाजार को बंगाल का सिल्क एम्पोरियम कहा जाता था इन सब चीजों को 
बंगाल के अलग अलग हिस्सों से इकट्ठा करके हुगली और कोलकाता के जरिए महाद्वीप के अन्य स्थानों को भेजा जाता ये जो सामने है ये भागीरथी है ये पद्दा से आया है ये भागीरथी इस जमाने में इस भागीरथी से ही इसका लगाव था और लोग इसी भागीरथी से जाते थे जो हुगली नदी में गिरा था और इसी नदी में ही एक जमाने में डच लोग ये सब यहाँ पर बिजनेस करते थे उसके बाद अंग्रेज भी इसी पर वहाँ पर फोर्ट विलियम उन्होंने बनवाया था और वहीं से उसके बाद कलकत्ते का शुभरात लेकिन सवाल ये है कि इस कारोबार का प्रबंधन होता कैसे था यूरोपीय कंपनियों के लिए बिना उन एजेंटों और दलालों की मदद के कारोबार करना मुश्किल था जो स्थानीय बाजार को न सिर्फ बखूबी जानते थे बल्कि व्यापारियों की विश्वसनीयता के बारे में भी बता सकते थे दरअसल ये दलाल काश्तकारों और निर्यातकों के बीच की कड़ी थे स्थानीय एजेंट छोटे एजेंटों के मार्फत काम करते और किसी खास उत्पाद को खरीदने के खसूसी हकूक हासिल करने के लिए उन्हें पेशगी रकम दिया करते इस प्रणाली को ददान या निवेश कहते थे काश्तकार तक पहुंचने का एक दूसरा तरीका था पाइकर या बिचौलियों की मदद पाइकर हर हफ्ते लगने वाले बाजारों या हाथ से सामान खरीदकर उन्हें बड़े या मुख्य बाजारों में ले जाते यहाँ इन कंपनियों के एजेंट इस माल को खरीद लेते थे स्थानीय व्यापारी सिर्फ पाइकर या एजेंटों की तरह ही काम नहीं करते बल्कि ये खुद मुख्तार स्थानीय कारोबारी हस्ती थे जैसे हाउस ऑफ जगत सेठ ओमी चंद वगैरह बंगाल में व्यापार का विकास और इसका अवसान बहुत कुछ गंगा और इसकी सहायक नदियों के अनिश्चित जलमार्गों पर ही निर्भर रहा है नदी के तल में गाद जम जाने से बड़े जहाजों का इनमें चल पाना मुश्किल हो गया आज के हुगली शहर को देखकर ये अनुमान लगा पाना बहुत मुश्किल है कि कभी हुगली बंदरगाह पर अनेक देशों से आने वाले विशाल जलपोतों की गहमा गहमी रही होगी ब्रिटिश काल में जिस कोलकाता बंदरगाह ने हुगली की जगह ले ली थी आज उसका भी उतना महत्व नहीं रह गया आज हुल्दिया ने एक प्रमुख बंदरगाह के तौर पर कोलकाता की जगह ले ली है जो कोलकाता बंदरगाह से काफी दूर है तो ये नदी है जिसने अतीत में भी व्यापार की दिशा तय की थी और कुछ हद तक आज भी ऐसा ही है
sometimes a good poem is is born from listening to a good poem if you sometimes you go to a, a poetry recital you you hear a poem and it creates the necessary a charge of pressure on your mind and you write a poem right there sitting right there in the audience so one doesn't know uh, how much yes. time is needed to write a poem i i can give you an example of that there was a writer called pa patchen i think uh, i'll so, sorry for uh, bad form on my part and i listened to his children children's poems and by the time i had come home uh, i used to live near the india gate in those days i had thought of three poems and a children's book of verse came out of that evening because i had listened to that poetry so this is just to a supplement what dr jain has said and sometimes from a conversation a poem grows like uh, uh, we'll come back to you in a minute uh, a friend of mine kept on talking about uh, what writing should be and how it should be the way we are talking today and uh, sounded like she knew a lot and i felt like i knew nothing and a poem you know just uh, uh, came to me right then as an answer to whatever she was saying though i never told her this it's a very short poem it's not in english it's in hindi if, if you if if you say i'll read it and uh, i mean i'll just uh, uh, the, the answer to this all the things that you know she was so certain about and i was not was tumhe hi hoga pata kya hai kala kriti rachna dharmita mere paas to khula aanchal bas vishwas mein ki anjuri se srishti ki koi shabd phool ab gira क्वेश्चन Uh, one possible response is that poetry is the most important thing that is left you know anything of value which is left with us any more is poetry because we need it this was the first human response to the um, to the to the uh, to the elements uh, the first utterance that man made that has stayed uh, was was poetry and uh, this should Let, let it be the last if we have to go some day so this ask is what how if i ask the out of the total population how much a percentage of people will be interested in genuine uh, or uh, uh, yes that's why poetry. i said that there are several questions in between your question one is in a poetry per se the other is is it value today and the other question that i am i am listening to within your question is uh, uh, who reads poetry do we need to write poetry what is its value and things like that it's uh, it i think it's uh, it's like uh, your personal faith it's like your uh, you know like uh, if you want poetry that's all you want you know that may be the most important thing in your life as if you go by its value you know uh, based on others response to it then it's a different question altogether of course uh in this world where we are uh, we don't have time for anything i mean we have to catch up us we have to be in our office we have to take care of our job poetry has no value nobody wants to read poetry and nobody wants to publish poetry look at the look at the situation of publishing in this country you can't get a book published if you write poetry today you keep you, uh, you you just you know take your book to a publisher you may not find one so that 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 has nothing to do with the value of poetry to me that means for one's own satisfaction one has to write poetry that no, what do you want to say uh, one has to love and write poetry mm -hmm. because poetry is important mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that uh, you know it, it 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 is important in commercial world okay uh, not okay. satisfaction i would use the word compulsion compulsion your yeah. no, you know, compulsion yeah, sure. to compel you to write yeah yeah uh, but i had uh, to deal with the same question at a more mundane level uh, if you recall dr zivago the novel uh, at the end uh, yuri dies and uh, a, a few sentences have struck me and i think they appear in the picture also where it is said that we were amazed at the kind of people who started visiting the grave so even when you talk about the status uh, the uh it is not as low as one normally thinks don't judge poets by their print runs by their royalties uh my last royalty for this book that i have only recently last 25 rupees uh, but that's fine uh, so don't judge it by that you know uh 
there is something else to it. And it is also, I think, reflective of uh, the sensibilities of a people. Now, don't think that I am trying to deride our own. But, for example, the Hindi belt is so huge and so vast and so big. And I was traveling with Hindi writers recently. And they said even their novelists, uh, Nirmal Verma was with me, and they said the print run is 1,500, 2,000, never more, even for fiction. Uh, for such a vast, you know, it's like a subcontinent, the Hindi belt itself, by itself. And in Russia, you'll, you'll have a print run of a lakh and a half, and it'll vanish three days after. Fourth day, you can't get it. At least for Russia, one knew before the present turmoil. So I, I just wanted to bring it to a more mundane level. Sorry. I'm not trying to make a case for poetry here or you try to advocate uh, uh, that poetry is important. All I'm saying is the different kinds of uh, food that we need, you know, not just the food that we eat, you know, there's food for our soul and there's food for our mind and there's food for, you know, so, so, so poetry is a certain kind of nourishment and we have to look at it that way. And, uh, and cherish it for its own uh, sake. And as uh, Mr. Daruwala said, if people don't read in this country, if they'll spend um, uh, 10 rupees on a bottle of uh, Coca-Cola every day, uh, and in a month how much on tea, but will not spend even 25 rupees or 30 rupees on a book, uh, then it's not poetry's fault, really. I mean, we have to attend to many other problems. We were traveling by Shatabdi and I counted the people with books. There were three people reading. One was Nirmal Verma, one was I myself, and one other chap who was reading a pirated edition because the print was very small. And three of us were reading books. Uh, Twenty people must have been reading magazines, Outlook, etc. And the rest of them were not reading anything. And it was a long journey, six hours. Compared, Delhi. compared this scenario to an international airport, there you will find that 60%, this has been my experience and I travel quite often, at least 60% of foreign travelers, that is, you know, the people in Germany, in England, America, they have a thick book with them, Always. which they mean to finish, even while, you know, they're traveling. Everyone has a book that costs, what, 15 to 20 dollars. Everyone. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that we have uh, become too much of uh, a consumer culture and uh, too much of, pre pre uh, you know, pragmatism uh, in the wrong sense of the word. Apart from the, all the, these technicalities, what are the minimum basic requirement for writing a poetry? I'm sorry, could you repeat your question? What is the minimum basic requirement for writing a poetry? Uh, that's a difficult question, but I'll do my best to answer it. Uh, the basic requirement, I think, would start with the impulse. Uh, you know, if you want to write a poem, something should impel you. That is one. Then a certain, I'm asking, I'm again tackling the question in a very mundane manner. Then uh, a certain control over the language. And it is best to go to... Excellent. Uh, excellence will come later. I mean, uh, you, you have to make a start somewhere or the other. Otherwise, uh, only the best writers uh, would start writing poetry. Then how would poetry flourish? So you have to make a start somewhere. Uh, a fair, a reasonable amount of control over the language and a strong impulse. Then the other things will fall into place. The image and the, uh, how to tackle it, long, short, all that will come by itself. But the effort has to be there. And somewhere or the other, you have to make a start. I think a call is coming. Yeah, we have the fax messages coming, but they don't relate to poetry as oh, such, I see. but other okay. organizational matters okay. related to the course. Can poetry be created in any time, or does one create poetry only once you want to spoil on a life? May I answer that? Go ahead. <laughs> I'll tell you. Does it uh, really come only when you are uh, falling out of life or uh, maybe you can create poetry in heavy times also? You know, this question was asked of us. Uh, I was in Singapore and there was a very fine Chinese uh, playwright with me. The three of us were being interviewed. And it seems Mr. P. Lal went there and he said, Good poetry. Southeast Asia, there will never be a poet. So they said, why? He says, because your economy is flourishing, people are thriving, people are happy. So you will never have a good poem. I, I think that is, uh, that is really off the mark. And I don't think 
uh, for example, the Renaissance times in England and in Europe, they were very happy times. They were voyaging for the first time. They discovered tobacco. They discovered a lot of gold all, all over. They colonized places. They went to new places. And that was the time when uh, the arts and poetry and everything flourished. And you, later on, you had Isaac Newton and all. It, it you know, spilled over into science and uh, other things as well. Uh, Galileo, Copernicus, the, the whole lot. Not Copernicus, but Galileo and Newton certainly came during that era. So I thought uh, when you are really making uh, money and you are thriving, uh, America, poetry is very, very strong. I, I prefer it to the uh, poetry being written in England to, to, to a great extent. But you may be f uh, flourishing. Otherwise, uh, the West has flourished for a long time and you have to say that there, there, was, there was no good poetry. And, I don't and, think that's and true. think of love poetry. Uh, when, when you are in love, I, s I do hope one is happy, you know, at least uh, it, 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 it may mean, you know, that you can't sleep and you can't eat, but, you know, there's a, there is this feeling of happiness somewhere that you are in love, thank God, and, um, and later on when you're not in love, thank God also, but um, this, this does create poetry, does it not? So, uh, and also affluence in a country and among people has got nothing to do with the person, you see, it's an individual. Uh, and I'll go back to this earlier question also, the minimum that you need to create poetry. You have to have something to say. This is the first requirement of any uh, art. I mean, something that was not, this is the definition of art. You have to create. Now, in order to create, you have to have something, you know, some either a vision or, or you know, something that you want to say. Something that you, this is the first impulse that you have something to say. The rest will follow. And it can come even in happy times, it rather it comes in happy times. Even the sad times are recollected in happy times. But to go back to you, sir, uh, don't wait for that. <laughs> don't wait for a very strong impulse. Uh, create one. You have to make a start somewhere or the other if you want to write poetry. Go ahead that way. Yeah. Sorry, ma'am. I, I think I'm making it a rather too simple, simplified thing. I feel poetry is an intensely personal experience that's felt, like you said, by the poet and which he wants to share with others. When I, as a reader, read that poem, I identify my feelings with that author's or poet's feelings. In that process, uh, there's a sort of catharsis. I identify myself and my feelings have been expressed so beautifully and I feel the satisfaction. I think this is the need, the urge to read poetry that is there in the readers. I, am I right? Perfect. Um, uh, and, and, said, yes. and said in different words, it could be that what you feel but cannot say, uh, you read poetry in order, or when you read poetry, you realize you felt that and you could not say it, you know, which is actually what you are saying also. Yeah, it gives me a release, sort of a pressure that's building within me which I am not able to express, but somebody has expressed it so beautifully. Yes. And I agree with him, or I feel somebody agrees with me, or same sort of thing is there in this. And even subject. if you don't agree, you see it's a different way of perceiving. You, you sometimes read a poem and feel, oh, I never thought about it in this way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, uh, it just, maybe, you know, your own perception be uh, becomes uh, uh, modified after that, uh, after seeing somebody else uh, look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the same scene. For example, um, it has always bothered me the way uh, the elderly sit, on our, sit in our homes these days. Uh, they just sit quietly in one corner or other people who have nothing to do anymore because they have to live with their children and they are, they are old and they have uh, no contribution to make. So, you know, I, I created a little picture of that um, in, in a poem and the way I see it may make you look at the whole thing in a, in a totally different uh, fashion. So, poetry sometimes does give us that, that sight, a new, new or different sight, not necessarily what you saw earlier. Which, which is what I meant by universalizing the personal. Yeah, the personal experience, which is Universal. touching others, which is able to touch the other person directly. That's a great poetry. So okay. for, for instance, sometimes uh, just a gesture, a look expressed in a particular yes. way, say the person is feeling lonely. For instance, my child uh, deduced that without my having to tell this. And, and then, uh, I, well, I wondered where it was, but the lines just reveal. So 
Yes. This, this may not be in the form of the rhymes or rhythms. The poetry can be in prose also, fiction also. Yes. Like, yes, for example, I, I had a maid servant at home. She is just a uh, 10th or 11th standard graduate, means learned that much. She read one of the stories of a big uh, writer. And she identified herself with the main character in that story. And I was so thrilled to see that how literature or poetry or writing can touch every heart. Not that this is uh, an urban person who has written about his experience, who had been who had gone to America and he came back to India and trying to find his roots. And this girl brought up in a small town, a village. She enjoyed it. She, she liked it. And she said, this is my story. This is how the, it transcends the limits or barriers of all social status or whatever you call it. And it touches every heart. That's creativity or poetry. Sir, would I be nice to say? Would it be correct to say that all creative writing, if it is written briefly and with a, a certain uh, words sounding in a rhythm, will become a poetry? I, I, I don't think um, uh, one can give a definite answer to that. Uh, brevity is, of course, you know, very, very important to poetry, and uh, music, music or some sense, sense of rhythm is also very important. But unless, unless there is um, something to uh, to put it all together, something you know, like a binder, something that that runs through all these things, uh, it, it will be a lifeless poem. It will it will be. Uh, something that looks like a poem, but it will not be a poem because um, ultimately it's it's an image or an idea or a thought that um, that that helps you in perceiving, not just words, not just sound. Though it may sound very nice to hear, uh, so some of uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the risks in writing poetry is that you can write a lot of bad poems. They sound pretty like, you know, very pretty poems with pretty words wow. and, and nice uh, rhythm to that or sing-song quality to that. Or um, uh, th these, are, these are poems that they don't stay with you, just like any bad art. Uh, so I think we'll start with writing bad, bad, bad poems. We all do. We all do. But what I say is that if we, we translate our creative writing, make it brief, and try to create, I mean, learn, how to, to bring rhythm in the words. Would that become a kind of a poetry, a beginning of it? Can I, can I take it on? Uh, you see, you are trying to define poetry. Uh, I, my uh, suggestions would be, don't get into that. I was just reading a lecture by Hausmann, delivered in 1933, because I had to come here. I said, let me look up a few things. Uh, one of my father's old books. And Houseman, talking of A. Houseman, you know, the man who wrote, the grave is a fine and private place, but none, I think, do there embrace. Uh, he, has a, he has a quality of his own. Houseman said that uh, if you ask a terrier to define a rat, the terrier will be unable to define a rat, but he'll go after it. So he said, if you ask me to define a poem, I won't. But both the terrier and I uh, know where to, to whom to home in on. So the poet knows how to home in on a poem. And uh, I don't think you should try and restrict literature and say if it's short and if it's terse and if it has a slight element of music, it becomes a poem. Don't get involved in that. You will know a poem the moment you write it, the moment you read one. Uh, it's like trying to define music. I don't think music is easily uh, definable, if I may say so. And I think we should not get into that. Definitions can be always tricky, and they can't be so all comprehensive and all embracing that they embrace everything. Now you said something about bad poems. Uh, I'll share. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll confess that I wrote 400 poems uh, initially, which I destroyed myself because uh, I realized that I was writing in a sort of a vacuum or a limbo because uh, I, I, the, po the kind of poetry I grew up on was not the kind of poetry I had to face and, uh, and, and the kind of poetry I enjoyed later on. So when I returned to, uh, to India and I saw the, where Hindi, the Hindi poetry had gone, I destroyed 400 of my poems myself and I have no regrets. 
बिकॉज इट इट वॉज जस्ट यू नो लाइक कलम को साफ करने वाली यू नो जो कहते हैं कलम रियाज यू नो इन इन म्यूजिक पीपल डू सो मच रियाज इन डांस एंड वाई शुड वी नॉट डू इट इन पोइट्री देन वाई शुड वी बिकम सो इमोशनली अटैच टू बैड पोइट्री विच यू नो वी आर सेल्स हैव टू क्रिएट इन ऑर्डर टू समाइम्स गेट टू एंड गेट यू नो यू मे गेट रिवॉर्डेड विद अ रिच पोएम जस्ट लाइक दैट इट जस्ट मे कम टू यू इन अ सेकेंड वाइल यू आर नॉट इवन लुकिंग फॉर इट so this this mystery we have to remember is there you know i mean it cannot be uh, cannot always be uh, analyzed or explained or uh, but you can't be be your own judge or yeah. sometimes you have to be and even if you have made them even if you make a mistake okay somebody may later on claim if sunita jain had saved those 400 points maybe they were excellent points doesn't matter i was not happy and that's good enough for me and if you are not your own judge then who else is you can't you know uh, be a vendor of your own poems and go around to people and say do you, is this good or is this bad if you don't if you yourself don't know it then remember ezra pound how he chopped yes. his own poem the is his great poem um he just kept on shortening it till it was only three lines yes. i think out out of 300 lines he saved only three lines yes. eventually and uh, hemingway who uh, uh, who edited um, the old man in the sea 200 times and finally it was only 60 pages that he saved and got the nobel prize for it i'm not saying that you know by destroying poetry we will uh, get to good poetry i'm not saying that petals on a wet black bough that was the second line of the pound poem it is a full page poem and then it was about a crash at a platform where people are dressed in red and you know in colors especially in uh, on a wet day and uh, petals on a i forget the first line but the second line is petals on a wet black bow and that is how he describes the crowd at a railway station and even if ezra pound was not able to write always great poetry he was one poet who made us very conscious of the fact that all unnecessary words have to be uh, weeded out of poetry so finally you are left with words that have got enough energy and charge uh, to 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 carry the message or to carry the vision or image or whatever you know it is that you are trying to say across and d- despite his syn- syncopated language which he used to insist upon uh, some of his poems read like a 19th century poem you know a beautiful the eyes of this dead lady speak to me for here was love not to be drowned out and here desire not to be kissed away the eyes of this dead lady speak to me this he wrote i think on a p- painting of venus reclining but uh, the rhythm has always haunted me and i have remembered the lines these were his early poems yes early poems but still they have a they over, yes he <coughs> sort of uh, somehow loses himself in the canto yes he does uh, on which i am working at the moment on a book oh, are you? on finnegan's wake and cantos yes mm-hmm. so i'm learning different languages for that too uh um uh, later on we didn't keep the images yes ideas that we were talking about but sometimes francesca or a uh, number of his early short poems were excellent as you said right i mean 19th century yetsian kind of thing in fact, uh, in fact in uh, fact people used to call him yets his son in law because <laughs> <laughs> because yes he was the father that lady you I know mean, uh, the the irish and um pound married uh, uh, oh, yes, dorothy yes. dorothy shakespeare dorothy. olivia you know yes oh, right yeah, yeah. yeah. your observation con- confirms um, something that i have always felt that poets do change you are not the person you know uh, the same person all your life uh, so when you start writing maybe you write one kind of poetry this is something you know worth pondering over and as you grow as your you know as you change uh, the world around you changes or something else changes you become a different kind of a poet in um, uh, the most interesting thing about a poet is this uh, graph you know or this uh, evolution you know of uh, how a poet uh, um, reaches um, or, where, or the journey that that he himself is uh, sometimes not aware of Mr I have seen Mr Daruwala change uh, at least you know twice in his uh, six or seven volumes that he has and uh, he's writing a different kind of poem today than he was writing say 15 years ago and you know his his early poems and this is this this, this is always there very few poets write uh, the same kind of poem 
uh, all their life. Same with painters. I am sure they don't Shakespeare. Paint. बनारस <laughs> But then you grow out of it, and then you go somewhere else. So the poetic impulses are basically, uh, if we analyze them, sometimes you know, at, at least it's true, are lyric and dramatic. So the, we keep on swinging between a lyric response to a situation, which is, which is very personal, very intense, very sometimes confessional in mode, and we try to balance it in order to write a good poem with a kind of uh, uh, control, which makes this personal response more dramatic. So we dramatize. so this you know this control between lyric and dramatic poetry is you know uh, sometimes it comes with age sometimes it comes with refined sensibility sometimes it's it's just there so people uh, sometimes you know have written very very dramatic terse poems very uh, very impersonal poems and then they graduate to very very personal poems a poet who's no more in hindi he said if i were to publish my later poems uh, people will really um, abuse me because i am known to be a very um uh, a poet of you know revolutionary uh, in in my thinking and now i'm becoming so sensuous uh, in my poetry my poetry is so erotic now and so he did not publish his later poetry and sometimes it's the other way around when you're young you may uh, write poetry which is extremely sensuous and then you know you grow to a different kind of poetry so this this uh, balance between lyric and dramatic you know is is, a, is the tension which gives rise to a good poem sometimes Uh, to go back to the commission poetry to commission poems i re i recall anne sixton she was told by a physician that uh, she was going through nervous breakdowns and he said one way to get through all this is by writing poetry and she got out of it by writing poetry though eventually she did commit suicide but that was totally commission she had never written a poem before in her life and she became a absolutely great poet and i believe there's a the psychologist or her counselor then published a book this was about 8 or 10 years and it became very controversial whether a counselor who is privy to all your personal confessions should be writing about the same patient after she is dead or he is dead uh, but this happened but silvia plath would be the other way around where you know you write poetry and you graduate to suicide yes so <laughs> so the poets are insane and can can you know cultivate insanity because of their poetry they may realize that they don't want to live anymore yes. so silvia plath may be the, the other example where um, you know sanity just you know tumbles why, why did it happen to the confessional poets more than others that they were led to this extreme act of self infliction paul celan was not a, a confessional poet he committed suicide but he committed suicide because he could never get rid of the trauma his family i think went to auschwitz uh, they were they were killed he escaped from the gas chamber he was a kid and uh, that memory haunted him and eventually he thought life was not worth living if he was all the time ha haunted by that memory so i haven't studied his life too well i've studied his poems well any kind of suicide see we have to be i think a little um, uh, careful to generalize but poetry can you know really to indulgence as far as your own personal you know self or psyche is concerned that you can over indulge yourself and uh, and start enjoying uh, your own wounds uh, because the the words are words are so um, uh, so nice to uh, to hear your own words or it can uh, it can be used as uh, as something that gives you control so it depends on each uh, writer how he is using his poetry because he has a certain relationship to his writing and that relationship will define how it is helping or destroying him i think you are you are you are both here saying what you said you were saying that a certain amount of sadness uh is a part of a poet for us i mean you you mentioned about the poet renaissance but but before renaissance there was lot of sadness and bad death and plague and lot of so uh, it is it is difficult to say whether renaissance produced poetry or the black death produced poetry black death was in 13th century yeah. mostly mm -hmm. uh, i visited europe and i 
I have no quarrel with that. See, I, I think it was discovery, voyaging, and all that. Yes. I remember one of the Hindi poets, Nirala, I think. Yes. That the Vyogi Hoga Prahla Kavi Haase Upja Hoga. That was not Nirala, but yes, it's a Hindi poet. Nikal Kar Naino Se Chup Cha Bhai Hogi Kavita Anjava. Yes. Now, this kind of poetry, I mean, clearly indicates the sadness. So poets have made statements about poetry and what poetry is, and uh, this, this has been there all the time. Um, Shelley, for instance, sweetest songs are those that tell of, and Sabse Madhur who eats Sanam Jo Dard Ke Sor. But if sadness is a word that crops up again and again, the way I would look at it is like this, that sadness is not necessarily sadness as we understand in its, in its uh, uh, you know, regular meaning. The sadness for a poet would be this urge to communicate which is, you know, which has to be there and that means, you know, you are not being understood or somebody has to understand. You put it, you know, the way you like. So the sadness, you see, of a poet is, you know, has to spring from this. The, the feeling of being alone with his own perception, which, which he thinks, you know, should be shared. So sadness should not, should not be taken as death, necessarily death of somebody or loss of something, but um, loss of contact. With, uh, with with other human beings. So poetry then becomes that, you know, that, that bridge which takes him to this other world. I agree. I must be wrong because you both look quite happy with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, happy to be with you. Uh, one subject nobody has touched upon, I thought, was, uh, you know, this religious poetry or mystical states because at least English poetry in India uh, with Sri Aurobindo and others trying to write about it. Uh, I thought somebody would come up with a question because my personal views are that uh, it's very difficult to write that kind of poetry because if you if you feel a sort of a flash within you or some uh, particular dawning of some particular light, you can't transcribe that into into words. And so what uh, the legacy of Indian poetry in English this century was things like ineffable light and effulgent light and, uh, you know, eternal verities and talking about infinities and eternities. I mean, modern poetry at least is time-bound or moment-bound and, you know, finite rather than infinite. Uh, so I, I thought somebody would raise it. I know I recently somebody, a colleague brought a son who has left a very flourishing career. This keeps happening. I known of an architect who dropped his architect uh, practice as an architect and took to poetry. And I almost wanted to ask him, why did you do that? Because uh, your, your poetry isn't isn't that good. But I didn't say it, of course. This man uh, thought uh, uh, got a very religious bent of mind, and he started just writing poetry. Gave up his job. I don't know what he'll do. And the poetry was not up to the feeling, you know, the feeling for the divine or whatever it is. Uh, the poetry could never match up to that. I, I, I'm talking about it because it was a recent case and somebody, a colleague, brought his son to me. Uh, these things also happen. Sir, I have got a question about the expression of inner compulsion you mentioned, which is right. I also feel the same. Now, my personal experience has been that there is a time when a poem is sort of occurring to you. You feel like writing out a poem, but you are in a situation when you cannot write. Unfortunately, most of such moments are when you cannot write. How do you retain that germ of thought or that germ of feeling with you to be able to write later on when you can? If it's very strong, uh, I'm sorry, I'm hogging the mic. Both of us uh, can respond to that uh, yes. very well because both of us are. Uh, both of his work. I mean, we work and we have the same problem. Like, you know, Keki may have a poem in his mind or a line or a phrase, and but he has to rush to his office and I have a lecture to deliver. So, but, you know, what has helped me? Uh, I, uh, I keep a now. I, uh, there was a time when the poems were so strong or the lines were so strong that they used to come back uh, later on. But now I find that it's a little more difficult. So I keep a very small diary with me. And I, I jot down a word or, or a, you know, as, as you said, you were haunted by a certain, you know, combination of words. So I just write it and try to recall the whole uh, sensation of, of feeling a poem from that one word or that one line and um, think about it at least, even if the poem doesn't come back.
That has helped, keeping a piece of paper and pen with me all the time. I don't know if I've answered your question. It, it, it does help, and if you sit down and write it at that time, it will be very different from what you will write it in the evening. If it, the impulse comes to you in the morning and you have to wait till the evening, uh, it will be a different poem, I'm afraid, very often. Because the thoughts as they came to you then, uh, the logic that they uh, followed, their particular logic, uh, uh, is different from what it comes to you later. Like Kubla Khan, uh, that was written in a dream. Yes. And uh, how he was able to um, retrace uh, his dream and, uh, and, and, uh, and write that entire poem is still a mystery because we all write poetry and stories in our dreams also. But we are not able to capture them when we are awake. So uh, that one person could do that or says he did, you know, is, is, uh, is quite encouraging. So maybe sometimes we can retrieve some of these poems which are lost during the day when we are ready to fall asleep. I don't know. I'm sure there's something to what Wordsworth had uh, also said about emotions recollected in tranquility. Mm -hmm. yes. So when she does come back to you later on, I suppose. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, A poem may stay with you for 25 years without being written. Yes, an experience, something, you know, you may go back to your childhood uh, to get, to write your best poems uh, when you're old. So we, we don't know where, you know, these poems come from, but, uh, but, uh, but they remain like, um, uh, you know, they, they, they keep on haunting you. So it's not that, you know, what you feel today is the poem that you, you know, that, that, that you have written. A poem might have been with you in your experience growing for 25 years. This um, situation of elderly people in a family, I don't know when I might have noticed that they have nothing to do and they sit looking so sad. And the poem that happened only recently maybe covers an entire lifetime. And I just, these are only four lines. Jani kitni chuppi thi baba ki, jani kitni baate thi baba ki sadhi hui chuppi mein. जाने कितनी बातें थी बाबा की सधी हुई चुप्पी में जाने कितने किस्से माँ की फटी फटी आंखों में कहने पर आते तो गिरता कुछ अर्रा के इसीलिए गीता में बाबा चौपाई में अम्मा बैठ गए थे जाके इसीलिए गीता में बाबा चौपाई में अम्मा बैठ गए थे जाके इट्स अ पेन दैट यू नो आई आई कैन नॉट पिन पॉइंट फ्रॉम वेयर इट केम दिस दिस होल फीलिंग ऑफ ऑफ सफोकेशन among uh, among the elderly. Why don't you read one of your English poems? Mm -hmm. You do that. <laughs> you are good at reading. No, go ahead. No. 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 The same thing. The idea is that uh, you have a, a certain moment of experience. You want to say something. Suddenly an idea comes to your mind. Maybe that stays in your mind for a longer time. Some more ideas, some more feelings add to it and it becomes a nicer poem or a better poem. I don't believe that it disappears. Maybe it may be a fleeting yes. idea if it, it disappears, but it's a strong feeling that stays with you. Like, for example, something came into my mind and I kept on thinking about it. It kept on going round and round in my mind while I was cooking, while I was taking bath, I, while, I, while I was giving food to my children. It kept on and on for two, three days. And it, so many things <coughs> Uh, I started identifying so many things along with that small thing like a glass of water, clean water. Somebody asked me for a glass of clean water. And then the clean water, where do you get it? Even in the filtered water, there is something. Even the, you boil the water, there is something else. So this kept on getting related to so many other things. Like even the kids' uh, nightingale, where there is no pure joy. It's not possible for human beings. That sort of thing, it may go on developing into a larger poem, but the main basic idea remains with you. Another thing, like you said just now, you read that poem, beautiful poem you recited. That's an experience you had in your childhood. I, don't, has been, I don't remember it. You don't remember, but I don't it is remember still it. in your mind, yes. which has been growing. Yes. It has been somewhere in the subconscious, like anything, something which triggers it at certain stage. It gives a shape to it, and it becomes a poem. Do you think so? Oh yes, this this is certainly so. And also remember that poetry is, after all, you know, it's, it's a magical world of words. And experience may only be something that you have imagined. Imagination is very important input or component of poetry. 
So you, it's not necessary that you have to experience everything or see everything. Um, like Buddha, uh, you know, who sees one dead body and can, can, can see the rest. Similarly, a poet, you see, can imagine so much. And where imagination stops and experience begins, or experience stops and imagination becomes very difficult to, to separate the two. But you're right that uh, a feeling, something stays with you and continues to bother you. And this is what I call sadness also. This is your own internal space, inner space, which no one can share. But, you know, the compulsion later on, the pressure is that you want to share it. And you are ready to share it, so you have something to say, and there is a poem. Yes. Maybe a neuroscientist can explain mm -hmm. what neurons and what interconnections and circuits get built up, that the image gets the right kind of sensory feedback, and then something works out here in the it's right place. Very, very studies are now being uh, carried out yes. that would help this process yes. of... Uh, uh, so many the can try to explain this, uh, how about, talk about creativity. That can uh, only talk about it after the event. You see Paul Valery, for instance, wrote so much on the structure mm. of consciousness and how... But one thing I must say that... Uh, we tend to sort of disembody ourselves and then think that something will occur here. But I think one has to live with one's senses and all your senses and feelings and emotions. And that helps because only then you trigger off and write kind of reflections and you reflect. So we, we take the uh, experiences in but do we really reflect on them? A reflection in tranquility, what words were said. So there has got to be some process somewhere which we are not consciously aware but it is there right. and does the reading of great masters does that help not only great masters I have a position on that which I, 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 was, I was telling Keki the other day that one has to read a lot of bad um, uh, mm. writing in order to know what it is that you don't want to write so if, if people keep on emphasizing these are great, of course your taste and all that you have to cultivate and you have to you have to know what is good and what is not good and so you know in a, in a comparative uh, <coughs> uh, frame. However, I also feel that uh, a lot of bad writing should be read so you know that this is bad and you don't want to write like this poem or like that poem. The knowing about the great writers, of course, helps because you know that they have. They, they have been accepted as great writers or they are great writers. But I, I no. What about the I, role of language in poetry? Because... Uh, I, can I follow yes, this up? Yes, Sorry, then up. we'll come to the role of language. Yeah. Uh, but I have, I get a lot of manuscripts. A lot of people come to me with their verses. And sometimes a student of physics comes in and he's done his MSc or MA in physics, do, doing IIT somewhere, teaching somewhere. And I ask him, have you read any poetry? Can you name a single Indian poet in English? They have no idea. A lot of people think there's a, I, I won't mention, some, someone in a bank I, who started writing poetry. And I asked her, have you, have you read any poetry? Do you know any poet? Have you read even an anthology how we are reacting to our environment and how we are managing things, facing our problems of language, etc., etc.? No. A lot of people think that they can just write. Uh, hi, how many months did you take to write this book? Uh, two months. When did you write? Every morning, half an hour. So you are sitting on your balcony having your cup of tea and you think you can write a poem every day and come out with a book. That's nonsense. Because you, you have to study poetry also. I mean, if you were going to write upon a tribe or, you know, you would have worked three years on it at least. That's what I told the person. But poetry, you think you can just sit down every, uh, every day in the morning for half an hour and you think you can, you can come out with a book, you can't. So there's a lot to be said about reading. And the other thing I want to say about reading, apart from masters, the current magazines, at least abroad, they are, they are very good. They contain very good poetry, some of them. And uh, you, one knows how people around us are reacting to, to uh, life as it is, to all the problems, uh, the village, I mean the global village, uh, we all should know how another uh, person from the global village is reacting to his or her problems.
Sorry, about yes, language, please. Yes, the, 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 when we, we read poetry, it is definitely some sense of images, uh, con concrete images, metaphors, similes. And shouldn't uh, our students be aware of this aspect, that you know, language has this, not just uh, the, the, the literary aspect, but the connotative aspect. And you have to go beyond. You have to make it more and more representational. You have to be able to convey in an effective way by using the words. Uh, the, the, the kind of diction, choice of words, all that is the actual craft of writing poetry. You have to compress the help of words, you have to convey much more than what the literal language could do. So don't you think they should be aware of these, some principles? I, I read your books yeah. so or your booklets and I thought a fairly good description has been given about metaphor simile, how mm -hmm. to avoid cliches. Yeah. and uh, how to avoid, uh, you know, uh, expressions which we normally use. I mean, uh, the old poetic diction is gone, the inversions have gone, you know, yeah. all that is over. But still, there are some words or some uh, things you can't use uh, uh, in, in poetry. I, I can't think of an example just now, but if I give half a minute to myself, I will. And those kinds of phrases would appall uh, Point. That's that's what I think. Another response possible to your question is that knowing about these things now it's 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 good to know. Yes. You should know because this is knowing is you know acquiring a skill. You must acquire skill like you know you learn language. This is a skill. You know you you know various ways in which language can be used is also acquiring a certain skill. If you want to be a journalist, you have to learn to use language in a certain way. If you want to be a poet, of course you have to know what all these, you know, uh, conventions, literary conventions are and, but it's also interesting to know after you have written a poet, after you have written a poem, that you have actually used some of these uh, uh, conventions, you know, without knowing them. So knowing, you know, about these things is one thing and the ability to create them is another. So that practice yes. is required. Uh, no, and terseness, no. terseness is very important and one good way of Le learning to be terse is to write on the computer. Mm -hmm. I write a column and I have to, in the economic times, and I have to normally restrict myself to 800 words. Mm -hmm. And then from a thousand, without cutting down on sense, I manage to bring it down to 800. And every sentence there are two or three un unneeded words. Sorry, yes, there's a little. Are there any rules to follow when you're translating from a particular Indian language to English? Like if you are uh, translating poetry from Malayalam, to English. Do you have to follow any rules? It should read like an English poem eventually. That's the only thing I'll say, but uh, Sunita will have uh, more to say. On well, that I, I'm glad you have asked this question. Uh, translations, you know, are very important. We read Neruda only in translation. We read some of the great Russian writers only in translation, but they were great translations. They were translations, um, you know, so good that they read like books written in English originally in English. Our problem is that every language has its own uh, temperament. So Hindi, for example, is very expansive. It takes 50 words to say what in English we will take 10 words to say. So when we translate, you know, what Mr. Daruwala has said, you know, uh, is very important that it should read like a poem um, in that language, in the language in which you are translating. Whether you are translating a poem in, you know, from English into Hindi or a Malayalam poem into English. A good translation is, you know, they, they say like a beautiful woman, uh, if she's, um, you know, if she's beautiful, she cannot be uh, loyal. So if, if it's a translation which is very, very close to the original, it's, it's not a very, you know, beautiful poem. If it's a beautiful poem, it's certainly not very close to the, uh, to the original. But the, the main thing is that it should read like a poem in the language in which you are translating. And that's a very difficult task. Yes, we are not uh, getting any calls from outside. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if they are there. There are some fax messages, uh, but uh, they uh, don't relate to specifically poetry. Mm -hmm. oh, there are not any poets out uh, there. <laughs> Is it because it's a Saturday? Uh, yes. Uh, no, they were there in the morning sessions. They were there, but after lunch, uh, no. I don't know. I suppose all the regional directors will be very happy to listen to you, to your voice. Uh, are there any students around anywhere 
we had calcutta we had patna we had uh, which other places we had karnal hyderabad calcutta but uh, it seems that uh, but th there are some uh, fax messages from some centers uh, yes any more questions anyway we are recording this and we'll be showing it to the uh, regional centers to our students at other places so these will tapes will be available for future also uh, well i had always been looking forward to this opportunity to in person meet uh, geki ji and record a program with him for our students of creative writing in english and when this time this opportunity came uh, and with it, or in all humility he acceded to my request um, i was really taken back by surprise and also sunita ji because i talked to her on telephone and she showed a lot of interest in and when i said that well you have to come and address the student she was very happy uh, in spite of such keeping such a busy schedule so uh, let me just briefly tell you what is this all about we are uh, you know for the first time we are holding an extended contact program of 2 days for our students who are based in delhi we have invited them to the studios here and um, i think because of the traffic jam which was there here uh, in saket um, the number was more in the morning some people left but i'm sure that many uh, more must have been waiting for a bus near the uh, cinema and then they must have, have a full house yeah <laughs> but uh, um, well uh, tomorrow we hope to have more students and they can watch the tapes later on if they so want and depending on the success of this teleconference will further improvise and improve on this kind of interactive session uh, with the students in future so let me tell you uh, uh, dr jain and keki ji that i have never understood uh, you know uh, what poetry is all about so uh, I mean, so well. I mean, you made it look so simple at the same time. You explained things in a very lucid manner, and um, uh, I think you gave us insights. And those of you who want to be uh, to practice uh, writing poetry, I am sure that this will inspire you. Uh, and once again, on behalf of the School of Humanities and English Discipline. Uh, i as coordinator and with neera out there we wish to thank you for being here with us thank, thank you. you very much thank you